The wall is directly across the street from my house. I could stand in my front door or in my front living room window and I could see the wall. One question people always ask me is, do you want the wall to be torn down? No, I don't. The history of what went on, why it went on, and how we can change things, that history needs to be told. I've been here for 62 years. We moved out here in February of 1959. That's me. When we moved over here, the wall was there. We didn't know what it was. Our parents didn't tell us what it was. I don't even know if my mom and dad knew. It was kind of like the fence. It divided Burwood and Mendota. And the kids that lived on the Mendota side wanted to come to the park so they would hop the wall. That's what the wall was to us. It was like a fence, you know, and that's all. I had a close friend that I often studied with in the library. But we had midterms coming up and my friend invited me over to his house, actually a couple of blocks from the Burwood Street. And we came across this massive wall which seemed to terminate nowhere, just went on and on. And he kind of smiled and said that the kids who come to the neighborhood, this is one of their initiation rituals. You climb the wall and walk it as far as you can. And I guess I got about a city block before I tripped fell into the soft grass of a backyard, and I just looked up at him and said, this is really absurd. Why would they not have put a, a chain link fence up to separate neighborhoods rather than this brick wall? And he kind of changed his expression, looked down at me and said, it was to keep people like you away from people like me. This is the Burwood Wall, part of Detroit's eight mile Wyoming neighborhood. Built to separate black residents on one side and white residents on the other, a housing developer built this wall in 1941 in order to guarantee mortgage loans for white families in a new development to the West. Loans black families were denied at the time. When the developer went to the local banks, they, uh, of course, uh, inquired of uh, the FHA because they wanted their mortgage loans insured. The FHA said, you know, this new development is all well and good, but it borders an area that is considered hazardous. You would be building homes adjacent to a black community, and there's potential for racial strife. And so he went directly to the FHA and said, what if I construct a um, substantial six-foot concrete wall, which would separate this hazardous area from my development? And the FHA bought it. When you see the Burwood Wall, you kind of think of a southern water fountain or a cafeteria counter. You think of an artifact that would be more associated with segregation in the south. You don't think of it in the north. But to see the construction of a, a segregation wall like this was an absolute slap in the face of black Detroiters, first and second generation, certainly. My grandmother, Bernice Avery, was a remarkable woman. It was my grandmother who became the vessel, the communicator, the person who led the community revolt against the inability to have equal treatment around housing. So the six-foot concrete wall remained on the line of the alley at the rear of Burwood. Carver Progressive Club members had been slapped in the face before, and this, though humiliating, did not phase their determination. Hmm. My family, my grandparents and my great-grandparents moved here many years ago, having migrated from the South. What they did find was that the struggle continued and that while the restrictions in the South were very direct, the restrictions in the North may be a little more subtle, but they certainly existed. They were told that there were places where they could not go, could not live. Bernice and other activists fought this injustice, writing letters to public officials and lobbying the government until they won access to federal loans and mortgages for the community in 1944. Because of their work, more than 1,500 black residents bought and built homes in the neighborhood. Among those were Teresa and her family. It wasn't so much that they were making a point around integration. 
or whether or not they cared whether or not they had a white neighbor. It was fundamentally that they should have the choice to live where they wanted to live. Her view was that as a black family, the right thing to do was to give them the opportunity to live in a home. That is just like a basic right. And in 1948, a Supreme Court case ruled against racially restrictive housing covenants, like the ones that prevented Black families from buying houses west of the wall. But as Black residents began to move in on both sides of the wall, white residents fled to the nearby suburbs. In the decades since, what was once a vibrant Black community was hit hard. The city saw a complex mix of challenges. Factory closures, racial tensions, job loss, bankruptcy. Over time, the Black middle class fled the city, and a housing crisis took its toll on 8 Mile, along with the rest of Detroit. It's changed a lot. A lot of houses are vacant around here, in disrepair. Just a lot of empty spaces, a lot of empty houses. When our family first moved out here, the majority of the people were homeowners. What I learned as being a homeowner, watching my parents and the people in this community, is that you take care of your space. I'm going to the park every day. That's what I do. I wanted to remain clean. I wanted to be nice. The kids always ask me if I own the park. You got another car, Ms. Teresa? Yeah, I got one at the house. You want to walk over there with me? Yeah. And I just tell the kids, no, it's not mine. It's our park. So you see me picking up trash. If you see trash on the ground, or if you have trash, just go throw it away. Y'all know what to do with that trash, don't you? Do I tell them about the wall? Yes, I do. Do they listen? No. <laughs> kids aren't really interested. These kids now are some different. While other relics of segregation, like Confederate monuments in the South, have been toppled in recent years, many here say they don't want the wall to be torn down. I think people feel differently about this wall than they do about other symbols because, for one thing, there's a beautiful mural on the wall that depicts something positive. It depicts happiness, togetherness, joy, peace, love whereas other walls gave a sense of something dark and ugly. Even though the Burwood Wall has that same connotation, the mural on the wall changes your mind a little bit when you look at it. In February, the National Park Service added the Burwood Wall to the National Register of Historic Places. I suspect there are stories like this all over the country. And I think increasingly, we have to extract their stories. We have to incorporate them into our history books. I think we have to teach kids, give them a sense of place. And you do that by letting them know what's down the block. Last summer was more than just a reckoning. I think it was an awakening. And the wall, the Burwood Wall, is an example of how far we've come and maybe how far we still have to go. My son has said to me quite a few times, Ma, why don't you move? I don't even see the sense in that. I love living here. How you doing, baby? Hey, sweetie. My level of commitment to this neighborhood, there is no way to measure it. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. There's nothing that can make me leave. I live and breathe this neighborhood. I do anything for anything, so. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.